Hi guys, welcome back to the Mystery of the Celestial Triangle. I'm Kaya Crone, and today we are picking up in Part 3B, Finishing Up San Francisco and the Golden Gate. So we wrapped up Part 3A by finishing up the Presidio. So today we're going to pick up right where we left off and we're going to move a little bit south of there to Laurel Heights. So in 1854, Laurel Hill Cemetery was founded and that is the red on area on the top, the trapezoid type shape. So that was 1854 and they quickly added three other major cemeteries. There was the Odd Fellows, Calvary, and the Masonic Cemetery, and that's all represented in the lower, larger red box. So these areas held these cemeteries for quite some time. And then around 1900, the mayor said no more burials can happen in the city, that the cemeteries were taking up too much room, and that they couldn't be wasting the prime real estate on dead people. So he halted all burials within the city. And in 1912, they passed a resolution saying that all burials had to be moved, that they were clearing out all of the cemeteries inside the city limits, that the only um, cemeteries that they were going to keep was the San Francisco National Cemetery in the Presidio and the original Mission Cemetery at Mission Dolores. And they basically bribed the families. They said, if you don't come pay $10 to move your dead relatives, then we're just going to dig them up and put them in mass graves. And that is what happened to a, a lot of the um, people. But there were also a lot that didn't get moved. Um, just like we found in Denver, some got sections of the cemeteries got overlooked. They are still finding bodies to this day during construction projects. But here's some things that I wanted to show you about these cemeteries. They were very populated with mausoleums, crypts, and tombs. There is a lot of age on these items. I mean, look at the, the mausoleum to the left. That's a tremendous amount of age for this to only be less than 100 years old. I mean, these things are only at most 80 years old. And many of them would only be, according to their narrative, about 50 years old. No one knows what happened to these mausoleums and crypts. They just strangely disappeared. The one on the right-hand side is actually a monument to Charles D. Young, who was a very prominent San Franciscan. And I cannot imagine that they would just tear this down and it would disappear, but it did. And the de Young Art Museum is who um, Charles de Young is. So. so what did they put on top of these cemeteries? There are several schools, playgrounds, the University of San Francisco. There is uh, several medical facilities, including uh, University of California, San Francisco Medical Center and Kaiser Permanente. There is, I mean, everything from Trader Joe's to Walgreens. And that's what they put on top of it. But it's curious to me that everywhere that they seem to clear out these, um, these cemeteries, they put either education or healthcare facilities or both in this case. All right, next up is Alamo Square Park. So this is the park and it looks like a lot of different things to me. I see an owl here. I see an hourglass. I see two bulls. I see the, the horns of the bull. This could be a uterus. It could be a baby. There, there are just a lot of things that this could be interpreted as. I'm leaning towards either another embryo or an hourglass. And also, I just saw this too. Look at this. This is like that headband thing that we saw last time in Denver at Del Mar Park. And this over here on the right hand side, it kind of has that thing over the third eye. It also can look like biology, cellular biology as well. But what's fascinating about this one is that we've got 
we've got four major exit points from this park that are that are tied to the figure in some way. So let's see where they go. So where do the roads coming out of Alamo Square Park lead to? So the one going to the north uh, leads up to a park and a school. The one going to the south also leads to a park that coincidentally has a labyrinth in it right here at the corner. The one going to the west ends up at St. Mary's Medical Center. And the one going to the right terminates at San Francisco City Hall. When I realized that Grove ran right into the Civic Center area in San Francisco City Hall, I was not one bit surprised. And I studied it from the overhead. Um, I distinctly see an arrow here. We've got the tail of the arrow um, right back here, moving all the way to the front where they've even got the head of the arrow marked off with the uh, street markings. So where does this, what does this arrow run through and what is it pointing to? So starting out at the tail of the arrow, the war memorial, yes, again, we have another war memorial, is right here at the tail. It's in this, this complex right here. And then you've got the Herbst Theater and the War Memorial Opera House on either side. We're not gonna look in detail at these buildings. We're gonna keep moving along. There's some other things I'd like to focus on. We're also not gonna look in detail at City Hall. This is the uh, replacement City Hall, quote unquote, for the one that was destroyed in the 1906 fire and earthquake, which we're gonna be looking at a lot closer, I think, in um, a bonus episode. This is the Civic Plaza. Right in the center of the plaza is a Masonic checkerboard design. And then we come up to nearing the tip of the arrow. So uh, right here is Pioneer Memorial. This is the public library. This is also the site that City Hall occupied um, prior to 1906. And then across the way from it is the Asian um, Art Museum. So we're gonna look at, at this group right here and then we'll move on to UN Plaza. Pioneer Monument sits right in between, in the middle of the street between those two buildings, the library and the Asian Art Museum. Um, it used to stand right in front of City Hall before it was um, supposedly destroyed in the 1906 earthquake and fire. Now the top of the statue they say is Athena. So we have another appearance of the Greek goddess Athena like we did in the city of Columbia associated with Academic Hall. So Athena seems to be associated with uh, buildings that have the name Hall and that wind up burning down. You'll also notice that there are other smaller statues that go around Pioneer Memorial. There used to be four of them, um, a north, south, east, and west. Now the east one was called Early Days. This one was removed. The west monument was called in 49 and it was about the, the um, gold rush. Now you'll notice that there are three characters on the west, three characters on the east, and then single characters for the north and the south. The north is called plenty, and the south is called commerce. Back to the overhead, you can see uh, the Pioneer Monument, and to the north side where the statue that was labeled plenty um, is situated, she is looking at another statue that is front of, in front of the Asian Art Museum called the Statue of Asher Bonapal. So this is the statue of Ashurbanipal. It was commissioned by the Assyrian Art Commission and uh, sculpted by an Assyrian descendant. It is a bronze statue that was placed in front of the Asian Art Museum back in 1988. There is, however, as with pretty much everything we look at, controversy as to what this statue actually represents. According to a local Syrian Silicon Valley engineer, he says, it's really very simple. The statue represents Gilgamesh. No Assyrian has a right to imagine things about our king. It's exactly like making a copy of the Statue of Liberty and saying it is George Washington. Assyrian kings didn't wear skirts. 
they wouldn't have been holding a lion or a book. It's an insult to the Assyrians. So to recap from the overhead, we've got the library, which used to be City Hall, across from the Asian Art Museum that has the Pioneer Monument in the center, with the goddess of plenty looking at the statue that could be Ashurbanipal or could be Gilgamesh. Moving into UN Plaza, we've got the United Nations and Federal Office Building on one side of the arrow and the Orpheum Theater at the other side of the arrow. So, of course, the Orpheum gives us another uh, sound and theatrical performance location. And then the UN Building and the Federal Office Building so this is actually where the UN Charter was signed in 1945. The plaza has got several uh, monuments, including an obelisk. It also has uh, latitude and longitude meridians in, built into the sidewalk. Let's go take a look at those. This was unfortunately the best picture I could find of these parallel markings that are in the middle of UN Plaza. There is a star placard right here in the center that used to mark the corner of the old city hall. And then there are distances that go from the this point to major cities, including London. And um, I have not been able to find a whole lot of information about this particular landmark or why they placed it here. I've been trying to find the text that is written on these columns that go up the plaza. I have been unable to find that information either. This is the best photograph I could find of the obelisk that is um, in front of the fountain. The UN charter is carved into the obelisk. This is the fountain that is in the plaza. But when I looked up the information about this fountain, it was um, allegedly designed to represent the seven continents of the earth and all of the waters um, that are contained on the planet are symbolically included in this fountain that is in UN Plaza. All right, from the overhead, let's see where this arrow is pointing. We take the lines at their literal conclusion. They're pointing right here to this building, which we really can't tell what it is from the overhead. So let's go down to Street View and see if we can tell what building this is. The building that the arrow is pointing to, and it is uh, now a CVS pharmacy, but it used to be the Odd Fellows Temple. I moved around the side of the building to give you a different view. So I want you to notice this artwork that is right here on the side of the building that has the tent with the Odd Fellows insignia that appears on all of their buildings along with the crescent moon and the seven stars and this eyeball. I'm most interested in this eyeball because I want to see where it's looking. So it's looking right over here at this building, which is 1100 Market Street. This is 1100 Market Street. All I've really been able to determine about it, it is currently a hotel. It was um, built as a hotel after the 1906 fire and earthquake. I haven't really found anything super significant about this building, but the eye is definitely looking at this building. So this entire area that the old city hall sat on and that is now currently occupied by the UN building and the federal building, the library, the Asian art museum, this entire area right here uh, yeah, you guessed it. It was a cemetery. The area was Herba Buena Cemetery. It was founded in 1850. There were, it was the only, for a long time, the only burial place for Protestants in the city. And they estimated that there were seven to 8,000 people buried there. And this was the estimate that they had in 1862. Now, the cemetery was abolished by the City Hall Act passed by the state legislature of 1869 to 70, providing for the removal of the cemetery and the erection of a city hall on the property. But as we have always found, they don't necessarily move the bodies when they say they're going to. 
And there are countless articles after countless articles about bodies popping up. Ten more bodies have been exhumed by workmen excavating for the west wing of the new city hall at San Francisco. So once again, we find that they have placed these prominent structures, uh, the UN, the federal building, the library, or what was City Hall at the time, on top of a graveyard. This is a death cult, you guys. It's exactly the same as in Rome, where Palatine Hill used to be a cemetery and they built everything on top of it. The entire foundation of this Um, society that has controlled the world for so long. It's all about death and holding people captive in their system from cradle to grave. But the last thing that I want to show you is right here in the Piazzo Angelo Courtyard of the 33 building 8th at Trinity Place. That's a mouthful, huh? But there's a statue in here called the Venus statue that um, I want to go look at. The Venus statue is San Francisco's tallest piece of art. It is a 92 foot tall statue of Venus now open to the public at Trinity Place, which is 33 8th Street. 92 foot tall sparkling swirl of a tower is situated in this quiet courtyard and it is surrounded by other sculptures of gods and goddesses that are encased in marble. You can see the other gods and goddesses that are scattered around um, the tall tower of Venus and their faces, parts of their bodies are in these other sculptures. They're in all kinds of disarray, upside down, sideways, Now, the artist, Lawrence Argent, is from Denver and originally from the UK, and he calls the uh, name of the statue Once Upon a Time. Guys, this is a big clue. This is a really big clue of what happened to the people that came before us. And look at this checkerboard floor that is created to give the optical illusion of steps or blocks to step on. Trapped in the granite forever. This one was the most stunning to me. This really looks like a liquefaction um, depiction. What do you guys think? Okay, making our way back to Alamo Square Park and moving back to the west. Panhandle Park is a serpentine shape. It has the tongue coming out right here at the end as it enters into Golden Gate Park. So the first thing you'll notice in Golden Gate Park is Corette Playground has a Fibonacci spiral coupled with a checkerboard floor. It also has this playground that looks like an owl again to me. Um, How about you guys? What do you think? One of the first things that I noticed about Golden Gate Park as well is that we are again seeing JFK with MLK. We've got John F. Kennedy Drive along with Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. We're not going to go item by item through Golden Gate Park because there's just so much. There really is a lot of symbology located just within this park alone. So I'm going to point out the things that I found most intriguing and that I don't feel have been covered Uh, very much on other channels. So let's look at some anomalies that we can find inside of this park. Let's begin in the botanical garden. So the first thing that caught my eye was this, medieval stones placed throughout the park. So these stones are scattered throughout the park and they are used um, as ornamentation. This is from Atlas Obscura. And they line paths, They've, they've made little you know, structures in the botanical garden. Some of them are just tumbled around. But here's the story of this whole thing. Allegedly, these weathered stones were a part of a monastery in Spain that was built in 1188. In 1930, the monastery buildings were bought and disassembled for William Randolph Hearst. And they were marked to aid reconstruction and they were shipped to California. Hearst planned to have the stones reassembled as a part of a retreat um, up in Shasta County. However, he left them in a San Francisco warehouse 
uh, and they just stayed there due to his financial setbacks during the Depression. Then, allegedly, in 1941, the city of San Francisco purchased these stones for the cost of the storage they had incurred by holding on to these for 11 years. Notice all of these time frames as well and the numerology attached to them. So they, um, they couldn't raise the necessary funds to reassemble them as a part of the De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park. And they just left these stones near the museum outside and unfortunately, fire and weather erased most of their identifying marks. But they, we see this trend over and over again, where they give us these backstories, these cover stories, where they've spent all this money to bring these things over from Europe or Asia, wherever they are alleging that they got them from. And then they just let them sit to the point of ruin. It, it makes absolutely no sense why you would spend this kind of money to bring something over and then just let it sit and decay. The other thing that I notice about the botanical garden is it seems to be shaped like an ear. Continuing to move west along Lincoln Way, we come down to the beach side of the park where the windmills are. And when I started doing the research for Golden Gate Park, the last thing I expected to find was anything weird about the windmills. But this is becoming a trend in these cities that I'm looking at, is that they create cover stories for objects that seemingly shouldn't need a cover story. So what it looks like with these windmills is that this windmill, the north windmill, was already here. The south windmill was the one they built and they created a story to cover this one. So let's look at a couple of newspaper articles and I'll show you why I think this. And it is said to have been erected in 1903 and that the architect was Alpheus Bull Jr. And that the South Windmill, the Murphy Windmill, was built five years later in 1908 website gave me even a little more information and it says that the Dutch windmill was conceived by John McLaren and Adolf Spreckels and then was designed by Alpheus Bull Jr. and built in 1902 for $25,000. And you can see that there's always discrepancies in dates, amounts, who's involved, um, all of the specifics. So, and, and this one says that the Murphy windmill um, was built in 1905 rather than 1908. I started to get suspicious after I found this advertisement in a 1920 edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. And it says, Mrs. Patrick Campbell and her Stern's night sedan at the old windmill Golden Gate Park. Now, why would you call it the old windmill after only 17 years of it being there? These are the oldest photographs that I could find um, of the windmill, and they're labeled as 1890 to 1906, so there is no concrete date. So I began searching um, as many newspaper articles as I could find about the windmill. And again, you would think that there would be quite a bit of coverage of the construction of this windmill, but there is none. There are no photographs of construction. There are no newspaper articles on the construction. The only reference that I can find is October 4th, 1901, where they just make this little blurb at the end of the park commissioner's meeting announcement that says, it was also decided to erect an old style Dutch windmill in the west end of the park to increase the water supply. The reference that I could find to this windmill was June 6, 1903, where it says it's in operation. The park commissioners held a meeting yesterday afternoon at the office of Spreckles, president of the board. Superintendent McLaren reported that the improved Dutch windmill on the ocean beach near the life-saving station was put in operation last Tuesday. Now, this doesn't say they built it. It says they improved it. So it's kind of like the wording that they used with Fort Point. They never come out and say they built it. They just hedge around it because they can't say they built it because the people who live there know that the windmill was already there. Okay, portals of the past. 
This is a weird story, y'all. So Portals of the Past is just this columnar structure that is sitting in the park. And it's on the edge of the lake of a little lagoon. So the San Francisco Museum lists uh, this house right here that belonged to Albin Town at 1101 California Street. Then, according to the museum, um, it was destroyed along with all the other mansions like the Huntingtons, Crockers, Hopkins, and Stanford's. Uh, was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake and fire, and they include a picture. Now, I've blown this picture up a little bit. Let's go take a look at it. Here is the house that they included. I found a black and white photograph of the house, and you can see that the columns are on the front, and they have the balustrade above them. Now, the photograph that the museum includes as um, showing that the house was destroyed and the earthquake and fire, these aren't the same columns, guys. This isn't even close. So the columns that they've got in the, in the park are ionic, classic ionic columns. The columns that are being shown on the left, while they may be ionic columns, they do have some curling to them. These are not the same thing as what you're seeing on the right. And they don't have the dental tooth uh, molding above them. Now, they say that the balustrade, this right here, this part, was removed. But you can see the dental tooth molding that is over the top of the columns here. And they also show here as well in the park. I don't know what this is on the left, but it is not the same set of columns. Next up is the de Young Museum. We'll be covering the 1894 Midwinter Fair in the World's Fair episode, but this was held in Golden Gate Park and the Fine Arts Building at the Midwinter Fair was one of the five main halls. It was also the original de Young Museum. It became the de Young Museum after the fair was over. And here is what it looked like. It was very Egyptian in nature. It was made to be, designed to be fire and waterproof. It had reliefs of lotus and palm leaves, as well as the heads of the gods carved into the columns. So according to the de Young Museum's official uh, narrative from their website, they say that the Fine Arts Building was designed in an Egyptian revival style and decoratively adorned with images of Hathor, the cow goddess. Following the exposition, the building was designated as a museum for the people of San Francisco. And the current building with its inverted pyramid on the roof was constructed in 2005. All right, making our way out of Golden Gate Park and to the south, we're going to come across the Mount Sutro Open Space Reserve and Twin Peaks. Of course, it has the distinct serpentine shape. There's also this oblong or um, this almost looks like a sperm to me. This body of water right here with the tail coming off of it. Sutro Tower is also up here. And Sutro Tower is a 977 foot three pronged TV and radio antenna tower. Just to the north of Twin Peaks, I noticed this, Mount Olympus, along with stairs that go up to it. So the Mount Olympus stairs and the Vulcan Street stairs. Just to the south and east of Twin Peaks is this little thing I found here on College Hill. Doesn't this look like a Wi-Fi signal coming out of this? And not only is Holly Park shaped like a brain, you've also got this um, elementary school campus right over here that's got an extremely bizarre. This has got to be a reservoir. Yeah, that's a reservoir. Switching over to the street view, I learned that this is indeed a reservoir, and it is a very old reservoir said to be constructed in 1870. So I find it curious that this brain-shaped uh, park is attached to a Wi-Fi signal and a body of water. All right, moving to the south and back over to the west 
from College Hill. I want to show you City College of San Francisco. So we've got another bow and arrow, very distinct bow and arrow right here. Just to the west of City College of San Francisco, we find the Urbano Sundial. It seems an odd location for such a complex design as the sundial. Here it is via street view. You can see that there are four other pedestaled uh, columns that sit around this sundial and they sit on their own four pointed star. Now, if you remember, what does the four represent in alchemical astrology? Four represents the sun. So at the time that it was erected, which is allegedly 1912 by the Urban Realty Improvement Company, it was the largest sundial in the world. And just in case you thought that San Francisco hid all of their occult rituals, let me read you the account of the dedication of the sundial. So they held the dedication at night instead of during the day. Because we always dedicate sundials when you, we can't see the sun. And on October 10th, 1913, they had 1,500 people attend this opening ceremony. Now, this day is significant because it is the day that the Panama Canal opened. Now, the narrator of the ceremony was this guy named Joseph Leonard, who was the manager of a real estate company. And grade school children, costumed as sylphs, unveiled each fixture. Beneath the sundial was a circular reflecting pool fed by a fountain, which contained two brass seals and was surrounded by colored lights. A child emerged from the pool and represented the releasing of the water's spirit. Paths lead away to four huge concrete columns and urns. Decorated with flowers and human figures, they symbolize the four ages of man and nature's four seasons author goes on to say that most of the old photographs of the sundial show children there. One taken in 1918 shows no houses even constructed in the background. Now they removed the reflecting pool and the lights. They were already gone by 1918, replaced by a single large light bulb. Now again, why do they do this? Why would you spend all of this time and money to construct this feature with the reflecting pool and the fountain and the lighting only to tear it out five years later. And the author says that he climbed to the top of it as a child and no one said anything to him because after all, the neighbors knew that this fixture attracted children like a magnet. And just to the west of the sundial is the San Francisco State University campus. And directly to the south of that is where we're gonna focus next on Juan Batista Circle. There are 11 of these X-shaped buildings throughout the area. Of course, Juan Batista Circle looks like another brain. This area comes out kind of like a compass and comes to a point right here. Continuing to move to the south, we're going to go through Daly City. We're going to stop real quick in the city of Colma. Now, Colma is where they moved all of the bodies to. And remember we talked about the four major cemeteries and then a couple of the lesser cemeteries. Well, this is where they allegedly moved everyone to, was to this town called Colma. And they just came in and started cemeteries and started moving all the bodies. And there are over 2 million people buried in Colma and the population of the city itself is only 1,500 people. Now, I know that this area is not technically inside the triangle, but I do want to cover a couple of things that are further south. So I'm on the map view and I've moved to South San Francisco. And this is how you know that you've been staring at maps too long, because this area that we're going to look at looks like Donald Trump's profile to me. In all seriousness, though, it really does look like a face, a head. So like this is the hair the nose, and even the lips are visible, and this being the chin. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I have just been staring at maps too long, but I distinctly see a face here, a head, and all of this stuff that is contained within it is Genentech. Genentech is a member of the Roche Group and is a biotech company specializing in gene 
Therapy. What is the Roche Group? Well, they own Roche Holding, Novartis, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, and Genentech are all under the umbrella of the Roche Group. We're going to wrap up this episode with some high strangeness that I found south of Foster City along the bay in this area that I'm going to call the complex. This complex contains a park and amphitheater, Google's World Headquarters, Moffett Field, NASA's Ames Research Center, several pharmaceutical labs, and some Amazon research facilities as well. We're going to take a little bit of a different look at this area than we have in other parts of this series, and I am going to include the Gematria. We're going to start right here at the head of this complex with Shoreline Park. So the first thing you're going to notice about Shoreline Park is the amphitheater that is contained within it. There is also this trail that is a spiraling trail that goes um, down the hillside here to the trailhead, and it was paid for by Kaiser Permanente. So the amphitheater was built in 85 and 86. It was commissioned by the city of Mountain View, and they asked local music promoter Bill Graham, who was a huge Grateful Dead fan, and a part of the Grateful Dead becoming a prominent fixture on the San Francisco music scene, they asked him to design it. And he uh, designed it to resemble the Grateful Dead's Steal Your Face logo. And if you overlay it on top, it is pretty close. I, I would have thought that they would have included the lightning bolt if they were gonna model it after this logo, but it, it is fairly close. The gematria for all of this is interesting as well. The Grateful Dead giving us 7-Eleven, Bill Graham giving us 7-Eleven, and Steal Your Face giving us 7-Eleven. The uh, park, the amphitheater opened on June 26, 1986, which gives us a primary numerology for that date of 11. It was the 177th day of the year, and there are 188 days remaining in the year on the day that it opened. Just some interesting background about it. The very first concert that was supposed to be held there was going to be the Grateful Dead, but Jerry Garcia happened to be in a coma at that time. So they changed it and they booked Roseanne Barr and Julio Iglesias as the opening act. So next up after the amphitheater is Google's um, headquarters. This is the Google Plex right here. And the first thing that struck me was how much this entire area just looks like a circuit board right down the, to the roofs of the buildings, looking like components on a motherboard. And I don't know if it was intentionally designed this way or not, but I'm starting to wonder if this is a means of terraforming. Are they literally turning this expanse of ground into a bigger version of a motherboard? And I want to hear from anyone in the audience who has experience with circuitry and uh, building computers. Is this something that would be possible? Could they be using the earth as the flat motherboard and putting these components on top of it to use as a supercomputer in some way? I'm fascinated to hear your opinions on that and to see what you think. Our next stop is Shoreline Technology Park and Alexa Pharmaceuticals. So the first thing that I noticed about Alexa Pharmaceuticals was, of course, the name and how close it is to Alexa with Amazon. And that the Amazon lab that developed Alexa is also contained within this area that we are looking at. Now, the company was founded by Alejandro Zaffaroni, who passed away in 2014. He was a Uruguayan... Um, investor. He invested heavily in biotech companies all throughout the Silicon Valley. So Alejandro Zaffaroni was involved in the development of products like the birth control pill, the nicotine patch, corticosteroids, uh, which are inhaled substances for people with asthma and COPD. And then he was also the founder of the DNA microarray. Alexa Pharmaceuticals is best known for their flagship medication dispersal product called Staccato. Staccato is a one breath technology medication delivery device. So what does that mean? 
it works like a almost like a marijuana vaporizer does they put the medication on a film the film is heated with a micro burst and then the medication is on the film and it is powdered and then it is delivered in um, a highly concentrated dose into the lungs so i did a little bit of research on who would be utilizing this rapid drug delivery system, who wants to put their drug formulations into optimally sized aerosolized particles for uh, distribution. So I went and took a look and this is the predominant use of it at this point in time is a drug called Adesuve. It is a inhalation powder that is for the rapid de-escalation of agitation. So it can only be administered by a healthcare professional because evidently the risks of respiratory distress and respiratory arrest are quite prominent in susceptible patients. So it can only be administered in a healthcare facility. But this is basically what they're using to um, calm people down. It is authorized for use with patients who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or dementia. So if we look at both of these drugs in the Gematronator calculator, Agisuve has a full reduction value of 19 and a reverse full reduction of 44. And 44 is usually associated um, as the death number. Now, if we look at staccato, we get uh, the same matching Gematria in full reduction, 19. Now next to Google and Alexa Pharmaceuticals is NASA's Ames Research Center. There is a whole lot going on in this complex. So you'll notice that Google kind of encroaches onto NASA territory and so do several other companies. Carnegie Mellon University Silicon Valley has a campus here as well. Now we're going to talk about a couple of features that are here in this complex. We're going to talk about the unitary plan wind tunnel, the research facility itself, and Hangar 1. This research facility was founded on December 20th, 1939 as a part of NASA's uh, Advisory for Aeronautics Laboratory. Involved with both the Pioneer and Voyager missions, they are most well known for their work on the Lunar Prospector and on GeneSat-1. And if you are not familiar with GeneSat-1, it is an alleged satellite that they sent into orbit that is home to a colony of bacteria that they are trying to keep alive in space. The photograph gives us a really good view of the entrance to the wind tunnel and how that setup works. It also gives us a, a great view of this area right here, the circular complex that also resembles um, an eyeball to me like we saw in some of our other locations. We've also got distinct bow and arrow symbology going right through the middle of the complex. Now the wind tunnel, the unitary wind tunnel has primary numerology of 244 and construction of this facility began in 1950 and uh, was completed in 1955. The tunnel consists of three closed loop sections, the first one being 11 by 11 feet or 3.3 by 3.3 meters, the other two sections being a little smaller, 9 by 7 feet, which is 2.7 by 2.1 meters, and 8 by 7, 2.4 and 2.1 meters. Now, the Apollo mission also has numerology of 711, like many of the other things that we are looking at during this portion of the presentation. And the um, wind tunnels were used to conduct the testing for the escape tower uh, for the Apollo mission. And the escape tower test has numerology of 211. It is said that the tunnel draws its power from a common centralized power plant. I could not find any information, um, I believe it is classified, as to how they generate the power for these wind tunnels. Up is Hangar 1. 
And you can see that Hangar 1 is just a skeleton at this uh, juncture when this photograph was taken for Google Earth. Hangar 1 is eight acres in size and it can accommodate six American football fields within it. The hangar measures 1,133 feet long and 308 feet wide. It was also built in 1933. On May 20th, 2008, it was listed as one of the 11 most endangered historic places. In 1011, Google top executives Paige, Bryn, and Schmidt proposed paying $33 million in costs to revamp Hangar 1 in exchange for being able to use two-thirds of the floor space to shelter eight of their private jets. In 2014, NASA selected Planetary Ventures, a subsidiary of Google, to manage Hangar 1 and Moffett Airfield. They then paid $1.16 billion over 60 years to lease Hangar 1 and for the remodeling of Hangar 1, and they agreed to this with NASA back in 2017. They are saying it will take until 2025 to complete the renovations. Eight years to do renovations on a structure that only took 18 months to build. And of course, Hangar 1 and Planetary Ventures both have 711 numerology. Notice on the full reduction, Hangar 1 is 47 and Planetary Ventures is the opposite, 74. Now, it's most famous for housing the USS Macon, one of the Navy's airships that was in deployment during the 30s. Now, the USS Macon was christened on March 11, 1933, had its first flight on 4-21-33, its transcontinental flight was 10-12-33, and then it crashed on 2-12-35. The USS Mason following the pattern of most of our military craft. We spend a ton of money on things that are only in service for a few years and then they disappear. The USS Mason is now at the bottom of Monterey Bay. Another first that involved the hangar and the USS Macon is that the first image that was ever transmitted across the wire was an illustration of the crash of this airship into the bay. Stop within the Ames Research Complex is going to be the Defense Innovation Unit, or DIU. The Defense Innovation Unit is an arm of the Department of Defense that contracts with commercial companies to solve national security problems. Now, there's a whole list of very prominent companies that they partner with. After digging a little bit more through their website and looking at their blog, they seem to have a, a concentrated amount of focus on drones and drone warfare, particularly ones like this, the Drone Fox. And it is developed specifically to defend against other drones. If you look at their open solicitations, they are actively seeking commercial, small, unmanned aerial vehicles for prototypes to convert over to military use. The request for proposals was a very fascinating read, and you can learn a lot about what our Congress is doing behind the scenes that the major media does not report on by looking at these RFPs. The rest of the complex is inhabited by Lockheed Martin, Intel, Juniper Networks, another Facebook campus, and Amazon Lab 126. So if there were ever any doubts in your mind about the collusion between these tech companies and the United States military industrial complex, the fact that they are all clustered together in these areas should dispel any doubts that you might have. All right, so that's going to wrap up part 3B, and next time we will be exploring the leg of the triangle between the Golden Gate and the Lion's Gate in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I thought I would leave you with this footage. I went out this morning. Today is the day of the equinox for my location, March 17th, and I spent the sunrise with my dog, Bear Henry, who is a one-year-old Newfie. And we hiked up to the top of the ridge and we watched the sunrise together. You guys have a wonderful day.
Blessings and much love.